Hi, Kala. I can't hear you. You're on mute. You're on mute. Uh, Pavan, who is the host? Because I'm not the host. As I, any... No, I don't know who is the host myself. Because I... has anyone logged into our Zoom? Because I there's, there's some uh, Raishiri was there. I don't know. Who... No, no, they could not have used our login. Wait, I do one thing. I log out and again log in because if I log in, it has to show me as a host. Then only you know we can do the recording. Now the recording is not under my control. So let me log okay. out. Okay. Okay. I'll also log out in that case then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, dear members, good evening and a warm welcome to you all. We are pleased to have you all here for the event Investment Strategies in 10 Years by Marcellus. What's nice about investing is you don't have to swing at pictures. You can watch pictures come in one inch above or one inch below your navel and you don't have to swing. No umpire is going to call you out. You can wait for the pitch you want. It's by Warren Buffet. Whether we have to swing or wait at the pitch, let us hear from leading investment expert and renowned thought leader, Mr. Saurabh Mukherjee of Marcellus Investment Manager. The name needs no introduction. Saurabh Mukherjee is a founder and chief investment officer of Marcellus Investment Managers. Saurabh was educated at the London School of Economics, where he earned a BSc in Economics with first class honors and an MSc in Economics with the distinction in macro and microeconomics. In London, Saurabh was a co founder of Clear Capital, and in 2007, he was rated by the External Survey as one of the top small cap analyst in the UK. In India, Saurabh was rated as a leading equity strategist in 2015, 2016, and 2017 by the Asia Money Polls. Prior to setting up of Masilas, Saurabh was the CEO of Ambit Capital. Saurabh has authored several books, which many of us knew about it, Coffee Can Investing, Gurus of Chaos, Unusual Billionaires, 
the victory project six steps to peak potential he regularly conducts seminars and workshops and is much sought after in the investment world for his expertise and selfless sharing of thoughts and ideas welcome mr saurav to ica singapore chapter before i invite mr saurav to speak i would like to invite invite ca pavan preet to share a few words over to you pavan thank you kala uh, saurav uh, on behalf of all the members of the singapore chapter of chartered accountants it's my privilege to welcome you and thank you once again for sparing your time today with us and sharing your insights on investing uh, i also take an opportunity for uh, you know uh, thanking ramki and rajiv to have organized this you know in a short notice and thanks to you as well to have accepted this and you know uh, let me just also add you over here that you know your your name and your your uh, reputation precedes and we have such a fantastic attendance today and thanks to the members you know for for uh, reposing that faith on to us as well uh for the members uh, i would request please keep posting the questions on the chat box we uh, ramki rajiv and myself we will keep taking all those questions and asking you uh sort of once once your uh, your in uh, your presentation is done and uh, without further uh, ado let me ask uh, ramki to set the floor for the evening and sort of you know we we are eager to uh, have your learnings uh, for you. us thank you so much thank you thank you, thank you pawan uh, good evening saurab uh, good evening members of uh, chartered accountants of india singapore chapter and our esteemed guests who have joined today's program i also want to thank nitesh a co-founder of marcellus for helping us uh, organize this event investing in stock market as all of us know as is an interesting area with so many variables at play from the business model of the company corporate governance competitive moat quality of ceo leaders and managers who run company and the ethos and dna on one side on the other side stock market is driven by liquidity flows market news government policies rate hikes oil and commodity price movements geopolitical developments like the one the current threat of russian invasion of ukraine you know i'd like to start today's session by requesting saurabh mukherjee to share with us the marcellus investment philosophy which what's the secret sauce adopted by you and your team what do you mean by marcellus way 10x in 10 years we're eager to hear that the format this evening is uh, is going to be a 30 40 minute overview by saurabh followed by a live q and a with the audience so members may please post their questions in the chat window and uh, myself pawan and rajiv will facilitate the same so saurabh the the virtual floor is all yours thank you once again thank you very much ramki thank you icai singapore privilege privilege being here uh, we are massive indian ca fans in marcellus so so whilst we are whilst we are migrants to india Uh, in the last 13 years, we've uh, hired 15 uh, uh, very bright CAs, and uh, chartered accountants are the are the spine of the Marcellus franchise. Nitesh himself is a is a very fine chartered accountant. Um, so very early on in India, uh, I realized that uh, when you are recruiting in India, you should be long long chartered accountants um, and short MBAs, right? So if you are to ask us what is the 10x in 10 years SAP, long CA, short MBA. and you like to make a lot of money in india but on a more uh, practical note uh, uh, there's three of us uh, who've been working together for 19 years now three of us have been working together for 19 years we started life together in the uk when i set up a company in london as you were mentioning i set up a company in london in 03 called clear capital uh, we used to look after the monies of around 200 250 british uh, british family offices and institutional investors we were specialists in We were specialists in UK small cap. Uh, Jan 2007, we did a little bit of maths and we realized that the that the British financial system is going to blow up. So the entirety of 2007, uh, entirety of 07, we focused on talking to our clients, helping them understand which banks in the UK uh, would blow up. Why would these banks blow up? What was the problem in their balance sheets? And we got them out. Jan 08, we realized that. that not just the us and not just the uk but even the united states is going to blow up so jan 08 the realization struck us that look it's not just a, a britain specific problem it's a global issue so we decided to sell the company we decided to sell clear capital in jan 08 uh, we were fortunate we found a buyer 
by March uh, 2008, one of Europe's largest banks agreed to acquire us. Uh, 10th May 2008, we got paid for selling the company. And that evening, we migrated to India. So that was 14 years ago, we migrated to the to the city of Mumbai, right? Now, you, as you can perhaps make out from our surnames, right? One of us is a Punjabi, one of us is a Karnataka, and one of us is a Bengali. So if you put these sorts of people in Mumbai, uh, circa 2008, we didn't know a soul in this town. So for lack of anything better to do, uh, we, we are, uh, we are, you know, we, we were trained to read annual reports in the UK. So for lack of anything better to do, we started reading the annual reports of Indian companies. This is back in 04, Lehman Brothers is raging. Um, uh, we are in, say, September, October, uh, so September, October 08, right? Lehman Brothers is raging away. As we sat in our little office that we rented in Pawai, and I still stay in front of IIT Bombay in Pawai, as we sat in this little office that we had hired back then, we realized very quickly upon coming to India that the core of the Indian stock market actually is a sham, right? The core of the Indian stock market is a sham. You guys are CAs. It's actually quite easy to explain this to you. So you ask any promoter, any business owner anywhere in the world, right? Ask him, ask her, how is the business doing? And the basic measure, the basic measure of a business's success is free cash flow. Can you generate free cash flow? If you look at even today, right? This, this evening, go and open the annual reports of the Nifty 50. You'll see that 70% of the Nifty 50 doesn't don't generate any free cash flow not in the last one year not in the last three years not in the last 15 years no free cash flow at all right it's a unique type of uh, business uh, commerce which takes place in india where india's largest companies generate no free cash flow whatsoever now there's nothing wrong with that it's not it's not illegal in india to run a business which doesn't generate free cash flows i don't i don't think it's illegal anywhere in the world but if you look at the lifestyles of these promoters as we did when we came to india in 08 we realize that the business doesn't make any money, but the promoter lives it up like a king, right? So cricket team, football team, Formula One team, six flats in Dubai, uh, uh, mansions in the UK, right? What have you, but the business makes no money. I'm sorry about that. Business makes no money, but the promoter lives the life of a Maharaja. So what we did for the first couple of years was in order to educate ourselves about how the country works, every week we would choose a corrupt promoter uh, basis the annual report, right? We didn't know these people were corrupt or good. We just saw the annual report and we'd been trained to spot fraud. And we would sort of, you know, put post-its, yellow post-its in the annual report. And then we would uh, drop an email to the company saying, look, as per your annual report, here's the issues as we see it. Um, and because those emails were very specific about very specific accounting issues, typically the CFO or the CEO would write back saying, okay, come and discuss it. And we would fly to the relevant city, Ahmedabad, or Kolkata, or Hyderabad, or wherever would sit down in front of the management team and say, look, help us understand what's happening here because what you're doing is pretty clear theft. I mean, it's quite easy to see money being drained out of the company. And I need to give a lot of credit to these companies. I mean, today it's easy to sneer at these companies from 10, the Nifty 10 years ago. Many of these promoters are in jail today. Some have run away to London. Some have run away to, uh, to Dubai. But back then, in 09, 010, these were incredibly powerful men usually. Um, to give credit to these men, they were actually quite magnanimous. Their point of view was because you're new to the country, you can only see three layers of theft. But actually, we are stealing money at six or seven different layers. And they gave us insights into how promoters steal money. Uh, we've published a blockbuster bestseller on this. I'll give you the book references later on. Uh, if you guys are, if you guys like forensic science, you'll enjoy reading up. Our, 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 our accounting bestsellers where we give the whole details on how which promoter steals money, how do they steal money, how do we as forensic uh, experts detect that. But focusing on the specific aspect of how do we make money for our clients, uh, using that first two years of expertise or experience, we created 10 forensic tests, right? We get created 10 for, oh, sorry, 12 forensic tests, 12 ratios. And basically we created something very similar to a health checkup. So when you go for a health checkup to your doctor, they look at your, say, triglycerides, look at your blood pressure, they look at your, you know, white blood cells and so on. And they have a, they have a range of observation, which is normal. And if you're on the wrong side of normal, they flag up, they get put up a red flag. So similarly, on these 12 ratios, we know what's normal because we've looked at these industries for a long time. And if we see metrics which are on the wrong side of normal, our analyst, our, our forensic team puts up a red flag. So we have 15 forensic chartered accountants from recruited from big four 
recruited from the big four over 13 years. They do this work every year in the month of December. So to, just to use a couple of simple examples, if you take this check, right, it's one of our simplest and one of my most sort of my, my most fun test, which is if you take the last six, seven years of data from the annual report, is auditors compensation growing faster than revenues? And it's very rare that this ratio has let us down. Wherever, wherever we find auditors comp is growing faster than revenues, typically that's the auditor being given chocolates to do, to do naughty things, right? You guys are ICI members. I'm sure uh, you realize that uh, auditors compensation is very difficult to grow. And if a company is growing revenues slower than auditors compensation, <coughs> typically is a, is a massive red flag. So back in 2010, 2011, this flag was what led us to Crompton Reeves. 2010 May Crompton Reeves was a blue chip stock. This flag led us to, to Crompton Greaves because we noticed that, that this ratio was misfiring for the said capital goods company then. Right, a more conventional forensic test uh, and you know globally one of the most powerful forensic metrics is the cash conversion ratio, CA4 to EBITDA. Right? So our analysts tend to know what is the expected working capital cycle in a sector. And if you know the, uh, the expected working capital, the typical working capital cycle, you know at what rate a company will convert operating profit into operating cash flow. So for example, in the pharmaceutical sector, typically on, a, on every 100 rupees of operating profit, 80, 85 rupees should become operating cash flow given the working capital cycle in that sector. But you'll see there's a very large pharmaceutical pharma company down south, prominent pharma company, which doesn't com convert operating profit to cash at 85. They convert at 65, right? That immediately back in 09, I remember our our aunt and I went up saying what's happening, prominent pharma company out of Hyderabad, why are they not converting at the desired rate? Um, superficially, the answer was is easy and the company still hasn't been rumbled. It'll be, I think, a few years out, it'll be rumbled. And as usual, once it's rumbled, everybody in India will say, hey, how did you know? There's no way to know. Nobody reads the annual report, so how will you know? So if you look at the said Hyderabadi company, you'll see receivable days are 140. Whereas if you take a relatively well-run, clean pharma company, say a CIPLA or a Lupin, receivable days are 70. So Hyderabadi company has twice the receivable days of a typical pharma company. The question is why, right? So uh, uh, back in 09, uh, we recruited from KPMG, a uh, gentleman called Ashwin Shetty. Ashwin today is our small cap fund manager. And Ashwin did the forensics and he, and he figured out what's happening in this Hyderabadi company. So, so th here's what's happening. And, and this is why living in India is so much fun. It's right? still an inefficient market. And, and therefore, if you, if you do forensics, as I was saying, just sitting at home with a cup of coffee and, and annual reports, you can actually make a lot of money. So, so typical pharma, let's take Lupin. Lupin is a clean company. When they sell drugs in America, they'll typically sell to a CVS or a Walgreens. CVS will pay Lupin in 70 days and that, that's the receivable day. Simple, very simple cash conversion cycle. What this Hyderabadi promoter did 17, 18 years ago is he took one of his employees in India and he sent the employee to America. He made his own employee, his distributor in America. Right? By doing that, he's able to, when he, when he invoices the American customer, de facto, he invoices himself only. It's his, it's his basically bacha over there. Right? De facto, de jure, it's called something else. It's called a, it's called a proper company. De facto, it's his own bacha over there that he's invoicing. So he over invoices liberally. Because he over invoices, he's able to overstate revenues, he's able to overstate profits, thus he's able to overstate net worth. On that inflated net worth, he borrows money from the banks. If you read our forensic blockbuster, uh, Diamonds in the Dust, we've shown this is a very routine process in India. Overstate revs, PAT and net worth borrow more from the banks. And then that uh, money that is borrowed in the listed entity is taken out of the list co using related party transactions to finance a, a private real estate business in the in the booming city of in the booming city of Hyderabad. So this is the racket there. It's been going on for a while. Uh, I can get into details, but perhaps you know it'll bore some of you. We can do that later on. So our job is to use forensics to basically scratch out that part of the market where the promoter is effectively stealing money from minority shareholders using accounting jugglery, right? And as I was saying, you know, when we were waiting for everybody to join, the Indian CA is a superb qualification. I've worked with CAs in the US, UK, I've worked with CAs in USA. The Indian CA is a blockbuster qualification. They're very good and our job is to tear apart 
uh, uh, the BSc 500's annual reports using forensic science and basically figure out the zone of thuggery. That half of the BSc 500, where the promoter systematically loots money from minority shareholders, short changes minorities, right? And this is many large companies do it. As I said, even within the Nifty, most of the promoters fall in this in this category. So that then leaves us with with around uh, that then leaves us with around around 100, 150 uh, uh, companies where the books are believable, right? So step one, build a white list of companies whose numbers you can believe. That's 100, 150 odd, right? So, so then we go to the next step of the process, right? We have, we, once we figure out that this company's numbers are real, then through 2013, 14, 15, 16, we met these cleaner companies again and again and again to understand are these people actually uh, smart about how they do business? It's just being clean is not enough, right? You could be clean, but if you're a moron, you won't make any money. And unfortunately, most of the clean promoters, they're good people, clean people, they're not stealing, but most of them are actually incompetent. And how do we know they're incompetent? Very simple criteria, right? Uh, oops, I'm sorry. How do we know they're incompetent? Can, can you guys see the slide on the screen? Yes, uh, uh, this is slide number six, right? Yes, yeah, slide number six. That's right. Yeah. Thank yes, you. yes, yes. Yeah. So most of the promoters where the books are clean, their business acumen, unfortunately, is in the greatest. And the way you and I can figure this out is this simple metric, right? A promoter's basic job, the reason a promoter exists is he has to deliver a return on capital uh, in excess of cost of capital. So if you assume, assume my cost of capital as an Indian investor is around 15%, uh, I need the promoter to deliver a pre-tax ROC of at least 15%. If a promoter can't put on the table a pre-tax ROC of 15% consistently uh, over the last decade or so, there's no point my investing my money or your money with that promoter, right? And unfortunately, whether it's listed companies or unlisted companies, 90% of Indian promoters fail this simple test. They're unable to deliver a pre-tax ROC of of more than 15%. In fact, typical in typical years, the Nifty pre-tax ROC is around 11%, right? Gives you a sense of how badly run uh, many of our largest businesses are. So if we combine, if we say step one, I want clean companies. Step two, we are looking for capable promoters. The number of promoters who pass both tests is the grand total of 40, right? So it's around 2014, we realized that the grand total of 40 promoters are are actually capable of compounding your and my wealth, right? Then we focused uh, very closely on these 40 companies. And as we did so, we hit upon an insight which, which changed our lives. Just one second. Uh, let me just try to get that other slide, the, the insight which changed our lives. So here is the insight which changed our lives as we zeroed in on these 40 companies. What we realized was India is the world's most monopolized country. Today in India, as we sit here in India in 2022, no more than 20 companies account for 80% of the nation's PAT. Right? 20 companies account for 80% of India's PAT. And the reason that's happened is broadly shown here. We'll get into details over the next 10 minutes. So if you see what's happened, when the country was liberalized in the early 90s, the top 20 PAT generators of that era, early 90s, my top 20 PAT generators were Century Textiles, Mafat Lal, Premier Automobiles, Hindustan Motors, the top 20 pad generators accounted for around 15% of Indian corporate profits, right, in the early 90s. Around the time my colleagues and I migrated to India, the top 20 pad generators accounted for around 30% of Indian PAT. Before COVID, just before COVID, the top 20 pad generators accounted for 60% of Indian PAT. And as I was saying today, uh, uh, as we uh, as we uh, approach the end of FI22, uh, our data shows that the top 20 PAT generators account for 80% of Indian PAT, right? So this is TCS, HDFC Bank, Kotak Bank, these sorts of companies. And what you'll notice if you look at that data set of the 20 largest PAT generators, right? Not only has their share of Indian profitability zoomed up, their PAT compounding is very consistently between 20 to 25%. So it doesn't matter who's the US president, whether it's COVID or malaria, Putin or you know, somebody else, you know, Modi, Mamta, Mulayam, who's running the show, what's happening to the Federal Reserve, these companies honestly couldn't care less. Their compounding engines around PAT are incredibly robust, right? Very consistent. We'll get into that. But there's a dark side to it as well. There's an unfortunate side to it as well. 
If you go to the Ministry of Corporate Affairs website in India, you'll see that there are roughly 20,000 companies in this country where the net worth is 10 crores or better, right? So roughly speaking, there are 20,000 companies in our country which are reasonably significant, 10 crores net worth or better. Out of these 20,000, if you remove the top 20, if you remove the top 20 out of 20,000, PAT compounding for the rest of the data set is 1% per annum. So uh, uh, I, 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 unfortunately, I only know Hindi and Bangla amongst Indian languages. So I'll say it in Hindi, but I'll keep it simple. In Hindi, the way we explain it to our uh, some of our Northern Indian clients and distributors is the way India works, the way India's economy has developed over the last 10, 15 years is it's Sabka Saath. It's Sabka Saath, but it's top 20 companies ka vikas, right? It's a very simple thing to remember. If you, if you remember it, it'll help you with your wealth compounding. It'll help you with capital allocation, right? Uh, yeah, so it's a so yeah, so, sab ka saath, top 20 companies ka vikas. Now, what I'll do over the next 10 minutes is give you a sense of A, why has this happened? Why have we been able, why have we uh, 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 ended up in a nation where, where PAT compounding, PAT compounding has concentrated into the hands of, of basically 20 companies. And secondly, how do you folks, as you know, uh, as a star, a star chartered accountants uh, living in Singapore, earning top dollar, how do you folks capitalize on this paradigm and make money in the Indian economy? Right? Because there's a lot of money to be made. The last 10, 10 years, $1 trillion of wealth has been created in the Indian stock market. And what I'm going to tell you is the simplest way you can do that for yourself. I'm going to reference my books as well. The books are easily available. In fact, they're pirated on every footpath of the country, uh, but you can get them in Singapore on, 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 on Amazon, right? Now, um, why has this happened? Let's start with that, right? So if you see this table on the right-hand side, What's happened in our country is pretty much any product or service, pretty much any product or service, which is essential for say my life or my colleague Nitesh's life, uh, uh, any product or service, which is essential for our lives, either one company or at most two companies end up taking home, end up taking home 80, 90% of the profit buy. Right. And it's very startling and it's very simple to actually see, just use our observations. I mean, we can do data, but it's easier if I gave an example. So I live in a suburb of Bombay, right? If I go to the supermarket near my house, the entire luxury biscuit shelf is one company. The entire, entire luxury biscuit shelf is this one company, right? So last we knew biscuits were nothing but sugar, flour and flavoring, but hey, one company monopolizes the luxury biscuit market. Staying with the same supermarket, the entire uh, economy biscuit segment is one one company, right? Named over there, Crack Jack, Monaco, Parley G, all products that we have gone up with, right? Britannia plus Parley is 85% of the biscuit industry's profits. One dominates the premium segment, one dominates the economy segment. They do not compete with each other. There's no fighting, no, no fighting. One premium, one economy. Result is Britannia is a 45% ROC company. Anusli Vadia, Anusli Vadia, the Vadia family were the promoters. Their wealth is comfortably six to seven billion dollars on the back of this business, right? So if you look at the other business, other businesses, none of them generate free cash flow. But this is such a stupendous free cash flow generator; it's made them six seven billion dollars worth. The Parley folks are unlisted, uh, but if you draw, if you uh, download the numbers from the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, they're worth around. I would say they'd be worth around three billion dollars. So nine billion dollars of wealth comfortably from two biscuit empires. If you look at the paint industry, a similar story. Two companies account for 85% of the industry profits. If you add up the promoter's wealth of these two companies, the promoters are worth $30 billion. Right? Similarly, in truck tires, in car tires, in cigarettes, in baby, oil, baby milk powder, in adhesives, in waterproofing, in cooking oil, in hair oil, in a whole host of B2B products such as glass lined reactors, aliphatic amines, so on and so forth, right? Roughly, 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 just to sort of simplify it, simplify this whole journey towards making 10x in 10 years, roughly, roughly 25 monopolists earn the entire the entire profit corpus in our country, right? I'm just simplifying, but I'm not making it up. The, the data is quite easy to get on the Ministry of Corporate Affairs website. 25 monopolists make the entire country's pack pretty much. Now, why should you and I be interested in these 25 companies, right? After all, you know, there's Facebook and Apple and, you know, you guys are in Singapore, so the whole world is your oyster. Why should you be interested in these 25 companies? 
the average return on capital employed of an indian monopolist is 45% right what is roc ebitda divided by fixed assets plus working capital plus cash in bank the average roc of an indian monopolist is 45 some do 70 some do 30 average pay 45% aata hai now as you know uh, our country has a soft spot for foreign companies right so you tell indians facebook apple netflix google microsoft toyota amazon they get very worked up right but the roc of a world class company the roc of a world class company such as the ones i mentioned is is at most 20% right a world class company if the promoter generates 20% roc he becomes famous books are written by him right books are written on him in india our monopolist clients don't step out of their house for 20% roc their drivers go to run that business in india the minimum ask is a 30% roc and as i said on average the monopolist deliver 45% roc and this number this 45% roc is the core to your and my wealth compounding so now i'll take you to our books and i'll start referencing the books those of you who are interested in uh, investing yourselves you can just easily buy these books a man called jeff bezos has made the audible versions free of charge so unusual billionaires is the book where we explained why the 45% roc number lays the foundations for 10x in 10 years with volatility lower than a government of india bond right so what we did, what did we explain in a nutshell this is what we explained for any company anywhere in the world right whether it is singapore airlines or whether it is air india or whether it is marcellus for any company anywhere in the world the amount of surplus that company throws off the amount of surplus that company throws off is a very simple equation which is roc minus cost of capital right so roc minus cost of capital broadly is the surplus the company <laughs> can i request the members to put yourself on mute please thank you thanks um so so roc minus cost of capital is the surplus a company throws off and this is true anywhere in the world this is not just true for india now in unusual billionaires what we showed was because for dominant franchises the roc was 45 assume cost of capital is 15 just keep it simple keep the maths very simple assume cost of capital is 15 the surplus a powerhouse franchise throws off in india therefore is 30% and regardless of whether the promoter is in chennai or chandigarh all all of the dominant franchises in india allocate capital almost identically as we showed in unusual billionaires which is One third of that surplus, one third of the free cash flow, let's put it like that in in sort of more technical English. One third of the free cash flow, they will they will dividend it out. The dividend will finance their lifestyle, right? So one third of the surplus, the promoter will dividend out. Typically, these promoters own seventy seventy five percent of shares outstanding, so the dividend will go to them only, and that will finance their 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 lifestyle. There's no need for them to steal money. Two thirds of that, two thirds of the surplus, two thirds of thirty percent, which is twenty percent capital employed, the promoter will slam it back into the business, and you can see this very easily. So, if you open Asian Paints' annual report, or Pedalite's annual report, or Titan's annual report, or Divi's Lab annual report, you will see capital employed goes up very steadily at twenty percent. Why? Because the promoter is reinvesting. Extra twenty percent year after year after year, twenty percent extra capital, more factories, more products, more staff, very very steady, right? Consistent growth in capital. Right? Now, provided the fellow has the the promoter has a modicum of common sense, given that he is consistently growing, given that he is consistently growing his uh, capital employed by twenty percent, you will see that free cash flow grows at twenty five percent. The left hand panel, so free cash flow to equity. Right, free cash flow to equity, nothing other than PAT minus capex minus working capital. Free cash flow grows at twenty five percent, and it grows at twenty five percent whether you take the last twenty years, the last ten years, uh, the ten years prior to that, the latest five years, the five years prior to that. It's very consistent growth, growth in, uh, very consistent growth in free cash flows at the rate of, at the rate of twenty five percent a year. And why are you and I interested in that? Because obviously, share price follows free cash flow. share price does not follow earnings right and share price does not follow gdp share price is not driven by pe multiples it's not driven by the ukraine war it's not driven by up elections share price is driven by free cash flow to equity so because the promoter compounds free cash flow at at 25% your and my and the promoter's wealth grows at 5% last 20 years 
last 10 years, the 10 years prior to that, the latest five years, the five years prior to that, the five years prior to that, you can see what I'm getting at, right? It's a very steady process. You and I are investing step one in companies where the promoter doesn't steal money. If you're unfortunate enough to invest in a company which steals money, which is one in two companies in our country, you cannot make money, right? He will make money. He will buy the six flats in Burj Khalifa. You and I won't. Step one, clean promoter. Step one, not just step five. Step, step one, clean promoter. Step two, rational promoter. A fellow who can show you and me that he's in the last 10, 15 years allocated capital such that the return on capital exceeds 15%. If he cannot do that, there's no point giving him your money. And step three, a monopolist promoter, a dominant promoter. What is the definition of a monopolist? A monopolist is a company where even if the closest rival cuts prices by 25%, our investing company should not have to cut price by even one rupee, right? We never ever invest in a company where there is price-based competition. So no airline, no telecom company, no real estate developer, no power and infrastructure company, no metals and mining company can generate sustainable wealth because they're competing on price. If you notice the names on the left, this is by and large our portfolio sans the financial services stocks, which are listed somewhere else. Right? Our portfolio is companies who don't compete on price at all. They compete on other barriers to entry. So for example, let's take, so let's take an example here. If you look at Titan, right, you'll see that uh, free cash flow compounding in the last uh, 20 years has been 30%, which is 200x. And unsurprisingly, share prices have also moved proportionately around 200 to 230x growth in the share price. Now, Titan has the highest making charges of any jeweler. Right? They're making charges that are a good 30% higher. Titan at no stage in their existence, Titan went to market and said, boss, we are the cheapest for making charges. So why is it that Titan beats the local jeweler black and blue? Why are the local jewelers winding up all over across the country? Right? The local jewelers are winding up because on four different fronts, they have no answer to Titan. And right? let's do this. Let's start with the simplest and we'll move to the most complex. The simplest is cost of capital. Titan borrows in the CP commercial paper market in Bombay at 4%. The local jeweler would be lucky if they can get working capital at 9%, right? There's a huge gap in cost of capital between Titan and the local jeweler. Even the regional chains will be lucky if they can get working capital at 8%, right? There's no comparison. Secondly, on talent, human capital, right? So if you see Titan's annual report, uh, uh, for the last 30 years, they've been run by IIT, IIM stars, right? So whether it was Bhaskar Bhatt uh, 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 till two years ago or CKV today, the creme de la creme, the best, the best IIT, IIM talent, the smartest chartered accountants uh, uh, run Titan. The local jeweler will be lucky if a BCom pass joins him. Forget about IIT, IIM. Third area. Uh, 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 Starting O1, Titan launched this concept called a caratometer, right? So using a, 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 a vetted electronic instrument, they are able they uh, give people assurance about the quality of their products. In addition, every wedding season, they launch three collections. So whether you're looking for a Tamil collection, a Punjabi collection, a Marwadi collection, a Marathi collection, Titan has it sorted out for every part of the country. There's a separate collection. These collections are modeled by by leading actresses from all across the country. Titan stores are, are three-story temples to jewelry and typically in glamorous locations. You ask any affluent Indian woman, she wants her diamond studded jewelry from Tanesh. She doesn't want it from a hole in the wall in Tinagar or Karol Bagh or Ghat Koper or Sarjapur. She wants to go to the, to the Tanesh location. The, the designs are modern, the quality is high, the intellectual property is cutting edge. Right? Uh, the local jeweler will struggle to launch one collection every other season. Right? The working capital costs, the design costs are heavy. And the final layer of monopoly, right? And this is one of uh, this, this, this ability to constantly up the ante, constantly crush the competition with newer and layer, newer layers of monopoly compounding is very distinctive feature of India's greatest compounders. Uh, just before he retired, Bhaskar Bhatt acquired a company called Carrot Lane for around 300 crores. He acquired 65% of Carrot Lane for 300 crores, right? So around uh, between the between the first and second waves of COVID, my daughter took me to buy a present for my wife at the local Carrot Lane near our store. 
and that's when I fully realized how how disruptive carrot lane will be for the rest of the jewelry industry. Remember, after growing like this, this 30, 32% cash compounding, Titan accounts for 6% of the market share. In the world's largest jewelry market, Titan still has 94% left to conquer, right? So disruption like this, a disruption like carrot lane is very powerful. So what does carrot lane do? Why is it such a disruptive model? So first off, if you go to a carrot lane store, it's typically one sixth the size of a typical Tanish store. So when I initially went in, I was underwhelmed because it's a much smaller store in a busy shopping area. And there are very few SKUs in the store. So there were only, I think, 40 SKUs in the store. And it's meant to be like that. I didn't realize it when I first stepped in. There'll be six or seven sales assistants with an iPad in their hand. So they will then say, look, uh, if you can't find what you're looking for in these SKUs, which you almost never will, why don't you look on our iPad, our entire collection is there. On the iPad, there's some 5,000 SKUs, right? So my daughter chose one. We chose a, 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 a ring for my wife. Uh, my daughter chose something for my wife. And the lady then said, okay, we will, now that you've chosen it, we will place the order. So I, I asked her, what do you mean place the order? She said, look, we don't make these things. These are outsourced to 300 other uh, uh, jewelry manufacturers. Uh, once you choose, only then will the order go through, right? And, and I made sure to realize they fundamentally changes the inventory, the inventory model. The conventional jeweler makes, puts it in a store, and then you go and buy it. Here, Titan waits for you to order on the iPad, and then they, then they place the, they tell the third party manufacturer. Then she said, uh, so will you pay cash or card? So obviously paid through card, but I realized it's a negative working capital model. I am paying upfront. And I'm doing so because I trust Titan. A regular jeweler, I'm not so sure I'm going to pay upfront. Right? I paid the entire amount upfront. So it's a negative working capital cycle. They are turning the inventory model around. They're turning the cash flow model around. The store is small. So sales per square feet are through the roof. Right? And then she gave the next punch. She said, uh, if you download our app, if you download our app, you'll get 15% off on the price of the jewelry. So obviously I downloaded the app and I got the off, right, the, the, the discount. But as soon as I did so, over the next month, I realized how powerful that is. Because in our country, as you might know, there are very few data privacy laws. So once you download any app in India, your phone is then completely captured, right? Your text messages are read, your, your geolocation is open for reading, uh, your notifications can be read. So, so obviously once Titan studied, you know, they always, there's, the, there's a whole ecosystem in India of, of tech companies who do this on an outsource basis. They could figure out my income, they could figure out what, what do I spend money on, when our birthdays are, when our wedding anniversaries are, and, and as a result, the cross-selling blitz began. And it's a very effective cross-selling they know exactly when our wedding anniversary is coming up, when, when my wife's birthday is coming up, when my daughter's birthday is coming up. And as a result, I'm cross-sold at an opportune juncture. So Carrot Lane changes the jewelry industry's model. It makes it lower, uh, le less space consumptive. So your uh, sales per square feet go through the roof. It takes it into a working capital negative model, uh, where the inventory doesn't sit on your balance sheet. It sits on the third parties. And it puts you on a cash, uh, you, you pay upfront. And thirdly, the cost of cost of customer acquisition radically comes down because of cost selling. So, so Titan is a great example where price is simply not a variable. Uh, uh, and, and our job is to look for such companies where the barriers to entry are absolute. There's really very little competition to these companies. And, and therefore, their ROCs are high because competition has been crushed by using a combination of clever business process and technology. ROCs are 45% are on average, which means free cash flows are very high. 20% extra capital is reinvested every year. As a result, free cash flows grow at 25%. And uh, we and our 10,000 clients uh, compound our wealth at that rate with volatility lower than a government of India bond. So that's what we do. This is called the consistent compounder process. This is the 10x in 10 years process. And uh, uh, sorry, I'll, I just forgot to say that. Unusual Billionaires is the business strategy book. Unusual Billionaires is the business strategy book. So those of you who want to learn, learn how uh, monopolies are built in India, uh, please refer to Unusual Billionaires. Uh, the latest blockbuster, the one which is unfortunately pirated brutally, is this one. Uh, this is the one where the first 150 pages is pure fraud, right? Real promoters, real theft. How did they steal? How did we detect? And uh, you know, uh, if you uh, if you are interested, because you guys are CAs, I'm telling you this. If you're interested in how just sitting with a cup of coffee and reading annual reports uh, helps you see through blatant blatant fraud by prominent promoters, uh, it's uh, worth worth uh, buying diamonds in the dust.
But that was it for me. I'll, I'll stop yabbering. If anybody has any questions, happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Saurabh. Uh, that was such a wonderful, eloquent talk on uh, the, Thanks. you know, India being the world's largest monopoly, 20% of companies making 80% of profits. 20%, 20, 20, 20 companies. 20, 20 companies making 80% of, of India's profit. Importance of uh, free cash flow compounding, ROC at all, you know. Uh, it was fabulous. Uh, one of the quest one of the questions that uh, have been playing on many of our minds is, yes, sir. You've got these sort of companies, sort of which you talked about, consistent compounders, um, and then you've got the likes of PTM, Zometo, Nika, the new age companies, tech led players who focus on GMV, customer base scaling up, running up huge losses. Of course, they are funded initially by private equity venture capital. And after a series of, uh, you know, A, B, C, and D fundraisers, they go on to do IPO and list the stock market. A case in point is the recent PTA stock market crash. So I just wanted to understand how do you, you know, sort out through this. Ranki, uh, you know, this, you, can, you can do what I just explained, right? You look for companies with ROC above cost of capital. You just use your common sense saying, uh, you know, if you read accounts, a company that doesn't make money, for itself can't make money for Ranki, right? Just common sense. If a company can't make money for himself, how can it make money for Ranki? So you can do that, or you can just look back at Indian history. So every 10 years, every 10 years, a new scheme is, is created for the strong and the clever to prey upon the weak and the impressionable, right? So every 10 years, India creates a scheme. So I was in the UK uh, in the 90s, but I read about it between 95 to 2000. In those five years, pretty much every day there was an IPO. Got and it. typically every day the IPO would be an IT services company. So something like 2,500 IT services companies, Ramki, were floated in that five-year period. Only 10 of them are still around. Wow. Okay. The other 2,490 promoters have long since run away with the money. Oh. Right? They're probably partying, you probably find them in you know Burj Khalifa or London, right? So that was the scam of that era. Then 2005, a new scam was created, which was power and infrastructure. Mm. And we were told, right, and my, my friends and relatives got looted in this. We were told, you know, please subscribe to this IPO. Uh, ultra mega power plants will be put up, right? And unfortunately, a lot of middle class people, gullible people, parted with their money to these supposedly power and infrastructure companies from, from Delhi, from Bombay, from Hyderabad. Barring two of them, none of them are around. Gone. Right? UMPP kya? Nope. There's no there's no power. There's no cash flow. Nothing. Promoter himself is absconded. So that was the 05 to 11 ka scam. And as you are rightly alluding to, this is the latest scam. Mm. Fintech, consumer tech. You read the annual report. You read the annual report. You'll see not just that there's no cash flow. Not that there's no profit. There's no gross margin either. Right. And hapless people from all across the country are putting their life savings, hardworking people, they're putting the life savings. So, so 10 years from now, there'll be another scam, right? I don't know what that scam will be. Maybe it'll be exploration of Mars or something, but every 10 years we will come up with such a story. And what you and I have to do is use our financial training to say, these are stories, right? The definition of a business model, the definition of a business model is how does a company make money? If a company doesn't make money, it's called a charity. Mm. Charities are good. I donate to charity, right? But I donate from Marcellus's CSR corpus. Yeah. And out of my, I knowingly donate to a charity because, you know, so we are a poor country. We need to close the rich poor divide. But what's happening is the rich poor divide is being closed to the stock market where the poor are being preyed upon. And, you know, we all need to use our wits about ourselves. You guys are, have a super, you have an advantage. You guys can read annual reports of the DRHP and figure out this is a complete scam. So, uh, sorry, uh, Saurabh, uh, let, me, let me ask a very different, uh, you know, uh, point on to it. So, basis that what you're saying, then all these startups or all the tech companies which have a gestation period have a story which probably would run, you know, into profits yeah. later on. So, you know, you <laughs> are giving up that so, upside, so right? Really easy way to so, a lovely point. So, you can, you can you can decide, you can actually use forensics to figure out which loss making company actually isn't a chore and which loss making company is a chore. How do we do that? So let's just compare to, suppose I was building a power plant. Mm -hmm. So Bhavan Preeti, you'll say sort of, so you're going to put up hundred rupees. That'll be cap, it'll be capex. That'll be capex. It'll be uh, uh, depreciated through your PNL. 
So your free cash flow will be negative at the outset because you're putting hundred rupees in a power plant, but you're promising us that as the power plant goes live, the power plant will generate cash flows, it'll sell electricity and generate cash flows. Right? It's a simple model. You and I know you know the risk I'm taking, and you know also how to monitor me. Okay. Yeah. Now, what these guys are saying is, was we don't build power plants. We keep launching. We keep expanding our business to newer and newer parts of India. So when we go to a new part of India, we are set up expenses are such that it pushes the prof, uh, pushes the PNL into the red, right? So what we then tell these people is, so we say that, चलो ठीक है, we understand you've set up in Manipur and Tripura and you're burning cash there, but you set up in Delhi eight years ago. So you set up in South Delhi eight years ago. Show me your EBITDA margin in South Delhi, because if you're not making money in where you set up eight years ago, you're certainly not going to make money. Uh, a, a, at a consolidated level, and what we find, Pawan Pri Ji, is they don't make money in their core business where it all began eight years ago, right? And and therefore, therefore, it stands to reason that there is no business model. So, if you guys want more on this beyond our books, there's a lovely book called The Platform Delusion, which was published five months ago, tearing apart. Uh, it's an American book, so it tears apart the American uh, uh, tech companies and the whole uh, you know nonsense that they peddle around mm-hmm. network effects and. Uh, Uh, comparative advantages and customer captivity. In simple English, the, if you don't have customer captivity, there is no money to be made from that business. Perfect. So, Rab, back to um, a question that one of the members have posted: What is important in view, your view, valuation or timing? How do you balance these two variables? And could you give us some examples of how you have navigated these often debated topics? Sure. So. So I'll, I'll I'll deliberately give you a little bit of my past to help you understand why we have such strong views on the subject. So our our surname Mukherjee is an Anglicization. So before the British came to India, we were called Muk Upadhyay, right? As you can make out from that, which means head teacher, right? So my ancestors were teachers on the on the uh, in Bengal. So we migrated from what what's called Allahabad today to Bengal around eight uh, hundred years ago, and and what my granddad told me was the way the business model we built was. we would go to one king and say sir you will prevail in battle right the sun shines from your head you will prevail in battle ram ki then we'll go to the neighboring king and we'll give him the same message and right? because in battle one of the guys is going to die right whoever wins will say uh, saurabh's ancestor such a wise man and they made us by because our prophecy came true or that's what the king thought uh, we, our, our our landlord was made our my ancestor was made a zamindar landlord right Uh, and this was a my land my grandfather said this is a very good business model you should give the same prediction to everybody right those who survive will believe they survived because of a prediction right now a lot of fund managers trade on this business model they they do forecasting we don't do forecasting we have no idea when to buy when to sell right that's uh, uh, you guys can hire an astrologer for that <laughs> what we do is something different right we look for companies where the books are clean Where the promoter uh, has shown competence, and most importantly, because of the monopoly aspect of the business, the com- business compounds at twenty five percent. Now, why does that? Why does that result in your and my not having to bother about timing and 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 this whole aspect of when to get in, when to get out? So let's get into that. I'll also deal with valuation. Just one second. I'll give you a slide. In fact, I'll give you guys a simple mental model you can use to invest uh, in India, whether you invest with us or. With anybody else, right? So, uh, just starting from first principles, for any company, for any company anywhere in the world, share price is nothing but the PE multiple multiplied by earnings, right? And therefore, it stands to reason the change in share price is nothing but change in PE as change in earnings, right? Ninety percent of Indian businesses fall into this camp. A is for airlines, right? I call it A is for airlines. None of our airlines make any money ever, right? So, if you look at any airline in India at any point in Indian history. None of them make money. Why don't they make money? Because there's no barriers to entry. Ram, Sham, Ghan, Sham. Everybody can start an airline. Because everybody can start an airline, return on capital never exceeds cost of capital for any airline ever. The earnings compounding is zilch perpetually, right? This is true for telecom as well, but that's a different story. Now, with these sorts of companies where there is no, this is 90% of the Indian stock market where there is no earnings compounding, the engine is broken. If the PE multiple doubles, with the grace of God, if the PE multiple doubles in 10 years. That means seven percent growth per annum in P over a ten-year period. Your total return, therefore, is seven percent, right? So, so if the P multiple crush is is half, then you are finished. But let's assume optimistically the P multiple on airlines doubles. 
and you will make 7% per annum. That's like a fixed deposit return. That's not a lot of fun, right? So that's the first category of stocks in India. Typical middle-class Indians do this all their life, right? And that's why they love that. Now, a better quality company, slightly better quality company, what I call Buffett type companies, Warren Buffett type companies, are say Maruti, Bajaj Auto, Hero Moto, HUL type companies. Why are they better? Because they have some competitive advantages. They have some barriers to entry, right? So if you take Maruti as an example, in a 10 year cycle, six out of 10 years, Maruti will have 26, 27% return on capital. That'll mean a surplus of 12, 13%, which they will reinvest in new factories and new products. Maruti compounds earnings at a 12% rate, right? HUL is very similar, Bajaj Auto, Hero Moto, 12% earnings compounders. If I was God, we are not by the way, but if I was God, I would buy Maruti at the lowest P, sell it at the highest P, double the P, and therefore you would compound at 19%. But the problem with this, this sort of uh, business model, the problem with this sort of investing is, uh, uh, as soon as you see me making money or I see somebody else making money, everybody will pile into Maruti. By definition, the whole country will buy Maruti in year six of its six year bull run. And because it's an auto company, it's bound to be cyclical. It'll have six good years, four bad years. And, and the moment the whole country has piled into Maruti, that'll be the worst time to buy Maruti. You'll compound at 12 minus seven, five. So disappointment again, right? 99% of Indian wealth, 99% of your, my friends and family's money is invested in such stocks. It doesn't make too much money, unfortunately. The reason we migrated to India, the reason we live in this great country is to invest our, our entire corpus in C's for CCG, C's for consistent companies. We invest in companies that, as I showed you, cash compounding is 25% year in, year out. If the PE multiple doubles, we don't complain. That's great, 32%. But, and this is the most important part, even if the PE multiple halves, we still take home 18%. Right, we make as much money when the uh, when Titans P multiple halves as Warren Buffett would when Maruti's P multiple doubles. Right, and this style of investing is unique to India. You will not find this in any other country. You will not find any other country where the largest jeweler makes for 50 percent ROC, the largest paint company makes 40 percent ROC, the largest footwear company makes 40 percent ROC, the largest undergarment company makes 60 percent ROC, the largest baby milk powder company makes 70 percent ROC. It's not possible to find this in any large economy because this is unique to India. This 25 percent cash compounding, the 10x in 10 years is unique to India. Obviously, over a 10 year period or indeed even over a three year period, the PE doesn't go up or down in a straight line. The PE cancels out and your compounding ends up becoming 25%, right? Those who do this style of opportunistic investing, power, infrastructure, telecom airlines, they're, they're condemned to a life of, of misery. The middle classes, the sort of um, upper middle classes, they get the reasonable returns. Unilever, Maruti, Bajaj Auto, 12%. Our goal is just to focus here. And therefore, we invest in, uh, typically invest in a 15 stock portfolio and 100% of our wealth is here, right? So this renders P multiples, timing, this whole shebang irrelevant. Our goal is to stay invested in companies who compound their share price and their, who compound their share price and their free cash flows at 25%. If that doesn't happen, that's when we look at the portfolio. We trade very little. In a given year, we will typically sell one stock we will typically buy one stock in a given year. There's very little churn in the portfolio, but uh, this whole business of timing and PE multiples is complete nonsense. We don't believe in it. Got it. Uh, just uh, uh, one question. Uh, so, sort of, uh, understand the concept of earning multiples going and all that, but uh, what's happening like in India, we see that the, the valuation multiple of these companies are quite north of 50s, 70s. Uh, you know, in their current earnings. So with okay. this, so, even if the earnings grow so, so far. Rajiv, so Rajiv, you're, yeah. you're a CA, right? Mm. Right. So valuation 101, valuation is equal to discounted cash flow. Correct. Did anybody ever say that valuation is discounted profits? Right. So, you know, when I was growing up in the UK, I used to get very perplexed. Why do people look at PE multiple? Because valuation is not discounted profits, right? Correct. If profits and cash flow grew together, it would be understandable. Mm. But as we just discussed with these companies, uh, with these companies, cash flows grow at 25%, profits actually grow at 15, 17%, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a company where profits are growing at 15%, cash flows are growing at 25%, I, I, sh I showed you guys that cash flows and I'll show it again, cash flows and valuation move very tightly in sync. One second, let's go back there. 
<clears throat> so here we go. So I'm showing you the data, right? I'm showing you, and you can ask for any time period. If you want the last five days, the last five months, we can send it to you. Cash flows mm. and valuations grow, ha go hand in hand. Now the problem mm. occurs, as you are rightly picking up Rajiv is, people don't look at cash flow. Most people actually yeah. in India don't even know how to calculate free cash flow. This is, includes many Indian fund managers. Right? They yeah. don't, if, you, if you, you could actually ask them, what's the difference between free cash flow to equity and free cash to the firm? They wouldn't know, right? Kabhi kiya nahi hai, right? So because they focus on PAT, they look at the mm. wrong. PAT grows even for these companies, even for a Titan, a PAT grows at 15, 17%. Titan share price compounds at 25 and therefore the optical illusion is bad bad gaya, sorry, PE bad gaya, because people are using the wrong denominator. If you look at price to free cash flow, it tends to stay pretty stable for these franchises. Okay. Now let me put it in a different way. Okay. Let me put it in a different way. Suppose we opened up a Excel spreadsheet, right? And we did the world's most basic Excel DCF valuation. Let's take a company which today has, let's take, let's say Titan today has hundred rupees of free cash flow. Uh, on Excel, it's very easy to do. If that free cash flow grew at 25% Raji for the first five years, and thereafter it decelerated to a, a long-term growth of 5% by year 15. First five years, free cash flows grew at 25%. Thereafter, it decelerates to a long-term growth rate of 5% by year 15. Take a cost of equity of 12%. You will see Titan's P warranted PE multiple wouldn't be more than 25 times. Okay, so very simple, very simple to show on a basic Excel. Oh. That if Titan grew at 25%, uh, and in fact, the slide on it might as well use that. Yeah. So, so scenario one, scenario one on Excel, uh, on this PPT, I'm sorry, scenario one, yeah. if the company grows at 25% for five years, but thereafter growth uh, decelerates, and uh, by year 15, uh, the company is growing only at 5%, and that's the perpetuity, right? This sort of company is worth no more than 25 times, right? And this is the typical company in our country, worth no more than yeah. 25 times because five, five years is a lot. Now assume that the same company, let's say Titan now grows at 25%, not for five years, but for 15 years. So we're in scenario two, we're in scenario two, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Titan grows at 5%, not for five years, but for 15 years. Again, that simple Excel DCF will tell you the warranted PE multiple is now more like, more like 79, 80 times. Right. And the last scenario where Titan grows at 25%, not for five years, not for 15 years, it grows at 25% for 25 years. The warranted PE multiple is close to 250. Right. Now I've already shown you that Titan has grown at 30% for the last 20 years. I've told you that there is no competitor inside. That's our job to assess the competitive landscape. There is no place in India operating at these levels of efficiency with this level of product innovation, with this level of technological sophistication. I've said 6% market share. We have very good visibility that Titan has 20 years of solid compounding ahead of it, provided they don't screw up on capital allocation. Titan's warranted, warranted P, it's fair value P, therefore is around 250 P. The market trades Titan, I think at 70, 80 P. Right? So if you want to do P yeah. multiples, uh, it's worth doing it like this, where you're making a call on the longevity of the superior compounding. Right? If you don't do this, right. most people, most people, how do they do DCF? They, they set up an Excel. They mod, try to model five, maybe 10 years and Turant, they faded to 15%. So it's Turant, they faded to 5% by year 15. Obviously, if you do that, every company is only worth 30, 40 P, you know, then everything yeah. above 40 P is a sell. So that's great for us because that opens up an arbitrage for us. Because the conventional fund manager who doesn't do our level of work, he believes that 50 P ke upar is a sell. They basically artificially cap the, the market multiple at 50, 60, 70. And our work is showing us that many of these franchises are worth 250 P. Right? And we are loading up and compounding. And, and this is a gift which never stops giving until our competitors do more work, which will happen as India becomes a more efficient market. Our competitors will do more work both on the negative side, forensics, and on the positive side, which is decadal compounding. Okay. No, thanks. That makes sense. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, Saurabh, uh, there are a couple of questions coming in from the members as well, you know, just for the ease for, you know, for, for them. I'm just re uh, repeating a few of the questions. One is uh, probably somebody read my mind as well. You know, uh, when, when you were looking for an exit, for an industry, for a, for a, for a company, for, from your investment. Is there a time frame? 
would you recommend or would you keep continue to look at the free cash flow and you know the, the uh, combination of uh, the compounding of the free cash flows and the share price and would you stay invested or yes. is there a you know time stroke uh, so your return uh, typical investment stays in our portfolio for 9 10 years so because our churn is only 10% right out of 14 stocks 15 stocks we typically sell one by by one so churn is 10% which implies that we typically hold a stock for 9 10 years now why do we sell that one stock sometimes two stocks a year right and why do we do that so so remember our entry criteria is clean promoter rational promoter track record of rational behavior not buying random companies in australia or you know funding cricket teams right clean promoter rational promoter and dominant monopolistic promoter so it stands to reason if any of these are compromised we will check out okay. right so so if we spot gadbad in the accounts we will what we will do is we will do a call like this or uh, now that covid has ended we'll go and meet the promoter we will take him through the gadbad we'll show him that we reckon we can see in the forensics that you know he or his brother in law is stealing 10 crores we will show him the theft and we'll then say look you decide what you want to do and if in the next 3 months pavan pj if in the next 3 months we don't see a bombay stock exchange announcement where the promoter has done the needful we will check out right? so that's the first criteria right we've stolen our money uh, you know you're a human being so you can you can unwind it so make the needful announcement at the bombay stock exchange and we will stay invested second is um, these companies remember high roc means very high cash generation so if the promoter gets a little lethargic right if he gets a little i think the cash starts accumulating on the balance sheet so we will again go and meet him on zoom call him and say what's the problem sir can you not find the meaningful ways to deploy the money and he might say i can't in which case we will say return the money do a buyback and if 6 months hence he hadn't done it uh, you know we'll keep talking to them throughout and we engage fairly fairly sincerely at the boardroom level we have no malice we have no agenda humko paisa banana hai you've got our money please return the money if you can't deploy it and if you don't return the money we will sell the stock right and third is uh, we are you know 91 my economy was liberalized we're now in 2022 so a lot of these promoters are pushing 70 so if they start throttling off right if they start throttling off and they start getting their bachchas to run the business and the bachchas are not up to the mark the kids are not up to the mark we will again take it up with the father saying either you train your children better or you run it yourself but if you're just going to you know hand it over to your kids because you know you believe this is some sort of kingdom which your kids will inherit then that doesn't work right you're a listed entity you owe it to your minorities to have high quality succession planning so these are the three subjects we engage very intensively with our investing companies um, these are uh, intense chats obviously these are not pleasant chats right we're not here to be friends of the promoter we're not his drinking buddy we are here to look after our clients interests most people listen to one pj as a result churn stays low these are intelligent switched on smart people uh, they understand they listen because their wealth more than ours is tied up in their company hamare portfolio mein to we have 14 stocks there he has only one stock and therefore he's minded to do the right thing and because these are good people they do the right thing we carry on compounding with them very little buying and selling or uh, a lot of our members are also investors in the us stock market as okay. you are aware uh, in terms of first principles and if you were to look at a similar investment philosophy and apply it to the us yeah um, would you be able to identify or you know share some names that have come through based on early analysis or what would be investment philosophy in the us in itself let me put it the other way around yeah so look i mean when we used to do this in the uk uh, we used to do it for ourselves uh, and my uk pension is still very much this sort of thing obviously we don't do it professionally our regulator still hasn't in, in india the regulator still doesn't allow us to uh, manage money in overseas stocks uh, we're, we're, i sit on several regulatory committees we are begging the people to do the needful but this style of investing works globally right and and two people who do it very successfully and you guys can you are free to invest with them uh, so one is called fundsmith uh, it's a 25 billion dollar london based fund house uh, run by a man called terry smith from whom we have learned a lot uh, and the second is called lenzel train l i n d s c l l lenzel train again around 20 25 billion dollars 25 billion dollars uh, 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 london based fund house so they invest in these sorts of franchises globally right so so accounting issues are a little less prevalent in the west because the federal uh, the sec did a lot of uh, cleaning up in the 90s and you know through to enron and arthur anderson accounting issues are less prevalent so their focus tends to be look for companies western companies developed world companies 
where the, the capital allocation has been very smart and where the moats are very high. As a result, return on capital is very high, free cash flow is high, reinvestment is high, and look for dollar compounding of 20-25%. So Fundsmith, uh, F-U-N-D, uh, Smith as in Blacksmith, Kijaga Fundsmith, and Lin Linzel Train, L-I-N-D, S-E-L-L, -L, Train. Um, so their websites are very helpful. All the data is there. They're very helpful contact centers. In our private capacity, we have got our uh, you know uh, overseas money invested with them. So you can try them. So they have what sort of portfolio stocks there? They have they'll have L'Oreal, they'll have Diageo, they'll have Thomson Reuters. Um, uh, they some of them will have Google, some of them will have Amazon, right? Um, and and you know as you can see over the last ten years, this strategy has worked very well and. Uh, you know, you guys are smart people and therefore you guys are asking very smart questions. The way you should think about your investments, the way I think about mine is every rupee I earn has to be invested in a clean compounding monopoly. Not a single rupee of my life's hard work should go in a company making, you know, commoditized things like metals, power infrastructure, uh, local flights, telecom. Ismail, there's no money to be made from that, right? So every rupee has to be invested in a monopoly. Because I live in India and this is my job, two thirds of my money is in two thirds of my money. My entire local savings is in local monopolies, and my from my days in the UK, my uh, UK car pension pot is in global monopolies, and that's the way we have thought about investing. None of this P multiple, you know, UP elections make kya hoga? What is the budget? And this is in you know, Federal Reserve of That's complete hocus pocus. That's useless. I mean, that's useful for you know chai coffee discussion. We could entertain ourselves you know, contemplating war in Ukraine and Federal Reserve, but that doesn't make money, if you see what I mean. That's not serious investing. Perfect. Sort of uh, shifting tracks a bit, India macro picture, you know, uh, both a zoom in and a zoom out view. This decade in India is meant to be a defining decade with high growth GDP, increase in GDP per capita, reforms. And India is an incredible melting pot of things that work and things that don't work, right? So what areas are you positive about and what are the areas that are still worrying? It's a bit of a macro question. So, so never think about sectors like that, right? Never think about sectors like that, right? You, you can have sectors which look ordinary and you'll have companies who will make lots of money. So until Titan did what it did in jewelry, who would have thought that jewelry will be such a lucrative sector? Until uh, uh, Bajaj Finance transformed the NBFC sector using modern technology and very high barriers to entry around, uh, around data science, who would have thought you can make so much money in NBFC? Think of, think of the broader framework around clean promoters, uh, uh, good capital allocation and monopoly barriers, right? And, and think of all of that in the context of this chart, right? So, so why did we migrate to India? What did, did we, you know, did a, did a, had a mad dog bitten us in 2008 that we, at the peak of our careers, we we migrated with my, I think my son was six months old. Why did we move here? We moved here because I studied at the LSE and I learned and I saw and I verified in my first four or five years of professional work is when you join up, when you integrate a large free market economy, right? When you integrate, when you consolidate a large free market economy, you create massive wealth, right? So for example, America between 1880 to 1930, Japan in the 40 years, 50 years after the Second World War, those countries got joined up. So 1880, America had the, uh, got built its railroads. 1900, the telegraph came. 1910, the Model T Ford came. By 1920, the road network was built. And as a result, because America got networked in those 50 years, uh, 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 every modern company that you know about in America, barring the tech companies, barring the tech companies, every other modern American company was born in those 50 years, right? So Wrigley's, Kellogg's, Pillsbury's, General Motors, Ford, Heinz, they were all born in those 50 years. Why were they born in the 50 years? Were Americans not having catch-up in 1870? Yes, they were, but the catch-up industry was fragmented. It was a local affair. Because Heinz was the most efficient ketchup manufacturer, he either acquired or bankrupted the chota less efficient players and the ketchup industry consolidated in Heinz's hands, which is why when we think of American ketchup, we think of Heinz. We figured out back in 08 that the same journey was beginning in India. And thanks to both the hard work of Indians, the foresight of our politicians, whatever you call it, this networking journey has gone full blast in the last 10 years. So India in the last 10 years is a country transformed. So 10 years ago, had I, had I met you, I would have told you India has 10 regional economies. Right. In the last 10 years, the highway network has doubled. 
uh, bank accounts have trebled airline yeah. traffic is up 5x broadband users up 50x plus gst so what have we done we have we have sealed we have joined the economy up when you join the economy up the local jeweler gets decimated a titan emerges when you join the economy up the local paint company gets decimated an asian paints emerges right that's the first aspect of the change the second aspect of change which is global but india is a unwitting beneficiary is the rise of low cost world class tech mobile cloud and saas is truly transformative for india because at very low cost at very low cost companies can expand their footprint uh, uh, quickly at low cost and it transforms the growth potential for companies in the 2 3 4 5 billion dollar market cap range right so our company itself actually is an example of this we have 10000 odd indian families who for whose money for whom we look after money out of those 10000 3000 come from towns and cities i've never heard of places i've never been to and why because these people are watching our videos on youtube they're reading our books on amazon they're reaching out to our sales team and we are signing them up using a salesforce platform so we are we are a small firm we have 20 salesforce licenses bajaj finance is 2000 but because of the way low low cost world class tech works our crm platform is the same as bajaj finances and we don't have to spend any money on systems integrators tcs etc we get benefit from modern technology these two things have combined beautifully the country has got integrated low cost world class technology allows smart companies to spread their footprint across this vast economy and the third transformative force which is pumping this line up is the attack on black money right this political overtones to it so i won't get into that but in simple english the attack on black money hammers the competition of the companies we invest in right, right? So the local jeweler has had his has had his roc halved by the attack on black money mm. a lot of the people i went to school with in delhi in the 80s are local jewelers in delhi they broadly they're throwing in the towel they were throwing in the towel partly because of titans competitive pressure but the attack on black money is very punitive for them right it's become harder to launder money it's become harder to evade taxes and our the inve- our investee companies competitors have been hammered by the attack on black money which acts as a catalyst for further rapid consolidation this is the macroeconomics that matters what doesn't matter is will the rbi hike by 3 300 bips over the next 3 years or the federal reserve will do will gdp growth be 7% this year or 9% that's complete time pass economics but unfortunately economics has been given a bad name by these uh, crystal ball gazers who masquerade as economists fantastic so uh, uh, sorry ram ki i'm i'm just putting in a few of the questions again by the members uh, given that most of us in fact uh, almost uh, 99% of all the members are outside of india yeah if they were to invest into your fund yeah. is there a way a b is that within you know uh, as a fund are you only focused on such companies with sector into india the region is india or are you also investing into you know us or other markets as we, well we only invest in india uh you only invest in india for other countries please go to you know very smart people at fund smith or so so back to the first question then yeah nitesh are uh, you on the line uh, yeah yeah yes yeah, sorab if you can explain how how the good folks here could could invest with us uh, absolutely uh, so you know indian origin uh, people uh, residing out of india they can invest in india uh, you know we can open pms account for you uh, It, it will be great you know if if any one of you are in country account opening process becomes far more simpler if you are in india at the time of account opening if not yet we can you know process and open your account you know we have tie up with hdfc bank where we open dmat account trading account and bank account you know we will ask for some set of informations we will send the pre filled forms you have to sign on all the places you know get the uh, 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 poa notarized and other supporting document notarized and give it back to us and we will process and open your account so uh, we can open both nre and nro account through hdfc bank uh, i will you know share my email id on on the chat box you know if any one of you if you have already have shown interest i have reached out to them one on one you know if you can drop me an email you know we will take you through the entire process in detail uh you know of account opening definitely we can open account and and good part is we have also you know got our licenses in us earlier we couldn't take any us client if they were not present in india but now uh, post you know we are now uh, 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 regulated in us we can take money from uh, you know nri clients who are in us so we can onboard them even if they are in us 
so so yes all of you can invest uh, you know uh, uh, i'm you know just texting my email id please drop me an email uh, uh, or whatsapp me i will share both my phone number and email id minimum is 50 lakhs uh, you know it's a sebi requirement in pms uh, we, you need to invest at minimum of 50 lakhs we can't accept below 50 lakh that's a regulatory requirement uh, fine, uh just a sorry just yeah, a quick question na pawan uh if somebody has a pis account because rbi allows only one pis yes, account so yes. if we are directly investing stocks can we still open a pms account yes yes you can so uh, so you are right uh, sebi allows only one pis account uh, rbi sorry but you can get extension but with the same bank so for example if you have uh, nre pis account with hdfc then we can open another uh, nre pis account in hdfc but if you have for example with icici bank then unfortunately we cannot open nre account for you uh, because we have tie up with hdfc uh, uh, access and kotak but hdfc uh, hdfc bank is the preferred one because they are quick uh, they open account seamlessly uh, in that scenario we will open nre account for you got it thanks and anitesh thanks a lot uh, can i also request you to you know, send and share the details uh with ramki i'm assuming that you have his contact details yes yes or with rajiv uh, you know yes. so that we can then circulate it to our members this yes. chat probably will not survive uh, for a long and therefore Absolutely. you know for for their benefit we can do I that i will do i will do that fabulous so um sort of just shifting tracks this was a fascinating discussion and i know we are uh, running uh, you know short of time but uh, i wanted to ask you uh, what do you do other than uh, marcellus investing what can you <laughs> and how do you unwind <laughs> yeah, so we got two kids who are growing up so son is 14 daughter is 12 so by the time i get done here uh, uh, you know it's off to see if i can help them with the homework which i usually can't now that they even if i could they don't believe actually i can help right and then you know, we have dinner, dinner with them and uh, you know like i think millions of people around the world you then sit down in front of the latest netflix or uh, amazon prime and you spend half an hour with them and then it's off to bed for everybody honestly it's a it's a really long day unfortunately so we uh, we get up at 5 o'clock and uh, we go to bed at 10 so it's a really conventional life uh, and saturday sundays we used to go around uh, travel around a fair bit unfortunately last two years hasn't happened but we are off to uh, off to nashik so we love traveling around india it's actually great fun and one of the things you know we've been one of the reasons we moved was we wanted the children to grow up here right. so so we we try to take them not just to say you know shopping malls in bombay and so on but as much as possible to, to small town india so that you know when they when they finish their school and when they finish their college education they don't settle abroad that's my biggest fear that they'll settle abroad uh um if you think about it right over the next 10 20 years even if you very modestly assume that this country's no nominal gdp grows at 10 11% uh the opportunities here for for uh, our children uh, uh will be immense uh, but there are challenges in this country it's a tough country to live and work in so our hope is if we show enough of the country to the children Uh, we give them enough of a flavor of real india they won't call back at the age of 22 saying they are settling down in the uk or us but hey uh, it's work in progress uh, so the the non work hours goes in trying to give them the best life we can yeah well thank you saurav it was a fascinating discussion and thank you for you know uh, mm -hmm. selflessly sharing so much of your thoughts and ideas your strategies and masterless uh, i'll now turn it over back to pawan and rajiv and kala thank you sir thank you thanks uh, ramki uh, rajiv and thanks uh, saurabh um for your explanation and detailed presentation and you will be sharing this presentation with us or uh, yeah, we have the presentation we have, we already have the have okay presentation. Fine, fine 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 yeah. that's fine thank you uh, pavan uh, now uh, for the quick word of thanks my invite yeah. pavan so sure. uh, i'm i'm sure that you know everybody uh, would have had a fantastic event today and thank you saurabh and nitesh for uh, you know transparently sharing with us i have a question which was asked uh, by the members uh, also which probably uh, you know was the first of the questions and it would be an interesting thing to know that you know did you get any life threats for mm -hmm. you know pointing out the yeah. <laughs> right right <laughs> those, that was the first question yeah. correct Correct. It does the forensic accounting when you are doing the forensic accounting. 
Yeah, so it used to happen. So the first few years when we were a little, little naive, we used to get people calling up at night with all sorts of nasty, nasty threats. Mm -hmm. But you know, you, we, we lived and we figured out our way around the country. Uh, yeah, but the first two, three years was a little scary because we were, we, we didn't know anybody and we were, we were, as I think you guys figured out, we were running into very powerful people. But over time, uh, most of those people, actually all of those who threatened us are either bankrupt or in jail. So it's, uh, it's, it's all right. All right. Uh, so anyways, uh, you know, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. That definitely, you know, is uh, very helpful for us. Uh, and, you know, a new aspect uh, for many of us, including me, uh, to basically stop looking at the financial ratios, which we've been always reading through and uh, doing forensic accounting. I think that those are the two takeaways that I am going to take today uh, for sure or before investing into it. Um, and, and I think uh, the compounding of the share price and the free cash flows, the relationship between the two, you know, they, they work in tandem, they grow almost, uh, you know, in the same tangent uh, is something that, you know, one, one uh, would definitely uh, like to see it going forward. And I'm, I'm really surprised and happy to see that, you know, you go consistently on a couple of industries, your knowledge in depth in terms of looking at monopolistic uh, company. And then, you know, work towards that and uh, make wealth for uh, your investors is fantastic. You know, thank you so much. Thank you. So On behalf you. of all the members, you know, let, let me thank you once again uh, for a fantastic uh, session that you took. And, you know, thank you. And I have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Thank you, oh, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Nara.